looks like it's running. Okay, welcome everybody. This is the uh, this is the first uh, uh, in a series of biology guest interviews that we're going to do for Bio 113. And I have uh, today with me uh, Dr. Seth Bybee. How are you doing today, Seth? Pretty good. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. Uh, so, Seth, where are you joining us from today? Uh, I am actually in the south of France today. Seth. I'm on, I'm on sabbatical here. Awesome. Yeah, Seth is a Seth is a probably nearly lifelong francophile, uh, and uh, and he gets to you know go to go to France on a sabbatical, and then they lock him in his house for two months uh, for this darn coronavirus. Right? It's hitting us. It's hitting. All, and it's a gut punch for all of us. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna just introduce Seth a little bit first before we ask him a few questions. So uh, Seth uh, did his undergrad at. Uh, Brigham Young University in Provo, uh, where he finished in back in way back in 2004 uh, in conservation biology. Then he went on to the University of Florida to get a PhD in phylogenetic systematics. Uh, after that, he did a postdoc at the University of California, Irvine uh, in behavioral ecology, and then did a postdoc in phylogenomics uh, back at Brigham Young University. And then shortly after that, he was hired on full time uh, as a, an assistant professor in the Department of Biology there. Uh, Seth and I go way back. I was trying to do the math. I think we, I think we first met probably about 13 years ago uh, at the University of Florida when Seth was doing his PhD uh, and I was doing my undergrad. Um, I, I think maybe I've known Seth longer than I've known my wife, uh, just barely, or it was right around. I, no, I think it was. I think I remember telling Seth about, about my wife when we met. Um, I remember that conversation. <laughs> that conversation. So anyway, so we go we go way back, and uh, actually, Seth had a you know a really big impact on me early on in my career, and has been a uh, a good sort of mentor and, and friend and collaborator since then. Uh, and I actually first met Seth. Uh, I tell the story a lot. This is kind of how I ended up. I feel like it was, this has sort of influenced my trajectory over the years. But I first met Seth when he was giving a talk at the Institute of Religion at the University of Florida. And I think it was called something like being an, becoming an, a disciple scholar in an evolutionary world, something like that. Seth, do you remember that talk? Yeah, that, that was the title actually. Yep. <laughs> so I was, uh, it was this kind of little, it was this, it was this lunch and talk series that we would do at the Institute. And, uh, and, I, and I normally ate lunch and then I had to leave to go to a, a calculus class. Uh, and one day I walked out and I was going to calculus class and I felt really strongly like I should turn around and at least go see the, the title of the talk. Uh, and I went back, I saw the title and I said, hey, this is really cool. This is something I'm interested in. And I felt like, well, how often do I feel prompted to skip calculus? So pretty much every day, but now is a day where I really feel <laughs> genuinely prompted to skip calculus. Uh, and I ended up talking to Seth and then we got involved together in uh, a research program um, and have been, you know, friends ever since. Um, so Seth focuses on uh, phylogenetics uh, for his research and he uses phylogenetics to cl help classify insect groups and then also understand the evolution of several complex traits, uh, including things like vision. Uh, he also uses um, uh, phylogenetics to uh, study the evolution of genes that support things like color vision, mostly in insects. Uh, and he also has uh, 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 a somewhat long-standing interest in, in teaching evolution and specifically uh, as of late, understanding how to sort of reconcile evolution uh, and religion. Uh, so to start it off, I just wanted to ask you, Seth, how, how did you first get interested in uh, phylogenetics? What are some sort of early important formative experiences that you had uh, that kind of pushed you in that direction in terms of your research focus? Yeah, so um, there's one that kind of jumps out to jumps to mind when you ask that question. Um, when I was so, um, my dad has always been interested in biology, um, generally, uh, and as we were, and not not necessarily in a formal way, but just introducing us to nature and how it worked and operated and how it was beautiful. And you know, when we were kids, we used to, we were just up to our elbows in it. We raised animals. Um, we would. We would, we would grab a, a roadkill, fresh roadkill off the side of the road and skin it up and tan the hide. Um, we did all sorts of things like that. We were just in it. Uh, we would do, I did some bird watching. Um, 
just little by little we were in it. I remember when my dad came home from a research trip, uh, he was in, he did a master's degree in archaeology, but part of that trip was uh, he collected insects for BYU. And I remember he came home one time and pulled this big, huge locust out of a vial. It must have been this big and put it in my little childhood hand, you know, and it covered... <laughs> It, it it was as large as my hand and I, I still have that memory I must have been four years old and that memory wow. is just ingrained and and that was kind of a moment for me not necessarily for insects and entomology but where biology was really interesting to me and uh, yeah. and then um, after that when I was 16 years old um, my dad uh, my brother uh, Dr. Dave Bybee there at BYU Hawaii some of your students may run into him too yeah. Uh, we all went to Costa Rica for two weeks, and uh, at the end of that trip, I was hooked. I had decided that I needed to spend the rest of my life in the rainforest, and that's just how I started. I knew I was interested in that. I was into conservation biology. I have a degree in conservation biology, as you mentioned, and uh, as I went to college and worked my way through, I, I ended up in a lab that studied um, the phylogenetic systematics of insects, how they're related evolutionary scenarios with insects and uh that this you know i started traveling with them and going to different parts of the world and just realized this is it this is my ticket and this is what i enjoy and this is what i'm going to do awesome yeah and i and i think uh you know i think that that experience is really similar to a lot of people who end up in you know faculty positions or research positions in biology kind of starting out with that love of nature love of science love of inquiry uh, and I think a lot of times, un, you know, students, you know, kind of ask or they kind of wonder, you know, how am I going to, you know, how did you get to where you are today? Like, how did you figure out exact, because we end up doing such specialized things that oftentimes people think, you know, students have this kind of misconception that they have to know, you know, this very precise thing that they want to do if they're going to end up there. And I think as, you know, both of us have experienced, it's not, it's not always like that. Our, you know, we have these kind of passions that kind of drive us. And then we, you know, we come into different experiences and different opportunities through the people we meet. And oftentimes it's hard to predict where we're going to end up, you know, from, you know, a certain point in life. Uh, so, so thanks, thanks for sharing that. I think that's a, I think that's a really cool uh, lesson to, to pull out from there. Um, so in this unit, we're, we're talking about, you know, phylogenetics uh, and we're sort of learning, you know, how to build phylogenetic trees and thinking about some applications. What are some of your favorite sort of applications of phylogenetics or sort of different aspects of that field that you think are particularly interesting to, you know, somebody who's, you know, an early biology student uh, somewhere like BYU Hawaii? Yeah, so I think one of the coolest things about phylogenetics is, is that we can create a tree of life, that we can take all these species we see in the world and we can take them one by one and place them on the tree of life. Um, and we can do this using DNA data, which is extremely popular today. Um, and we're getting really good at getting lots of DNA to get pretty accurate placements on this tree of life. Um, but we can also use things like, uh, like anatomy or in, in, in my field of science, we call anatomy essentially morphology, right. which are physical structures inside and outside of the organism that we can use to, to, uh, to essentially um, figure out which organisms are most closely related to each other and where they would fit on the tree. And that's really important when you're working with groups like fossils that have no DNA, but they, right. have, uh, they, they have available morphology. And so if we work hard enough at this and, and, and we continue to chip away at it, there's this opportunity to create the tree of life, not only for living organisms, but for all organisms on earth that have ever lived that we know about. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It really is a powerful uh, thing to think about being able to kind of plot this, you know, basically the, not only how things are related, but also, you know, there's just so much information encoded in that phylogeny, you know, just thinking about how, you know, life evolved. Uh, thinking about how all these really cool traits that we see in different organisms, how they evolved over time, and then putting it in the context of, you know, things like time, you know, by looking at, you know, the fossil record and figuring out, you know, really kind of piecing together that history of life. It's like this roadmap almost of, 
everything that's alive or everything that ever has been alive. Uh, and there's so much power uh, to that, I think. And a lot of times I know uh, people, people think about it or, you know, sometimes it sort of criticizes this kind of observational thing, but there's so much, you know, cool, like experimental, you know, work that can be done or testing that can be done with the phylogeny and with phylogenetics that, that, that I think is, you know, super important for everybody to, to grasp. Yeah, I mean, phylogenetics is incredibly powerful. It doesn't, it doesn't only allow us to organize this tree of life and to, and to, recre and to, re to rebuild it. Because our, our DNA holds our, the history of who we are, of who other organisms are. And as we compare those histories, you can see who shares the most closely related histories. That's how we do it. Yeah. But it goes beyond that too. I mean, once we have things in, in essentially a phylogenetic tree, we're able to ask questions about how things evolve. Yeah. I mean, just with this virus, the, the COVID virus that we're dealing with now, we're able to kind of, we're able to essentially figure out where it came from, um, which appears to be a bat, right? But not only that, we can look at, we can look at how it's related to other viruses and how those viruses have affected human populations. And, and, and then we can kind of try and get out in front of it or make educated guesses and models and all these things about right. how to best approach living with this virus and hopefully beating it. And that all comes from, from a phylogenetic perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, I, I think sometimes people think of this as like, um, you know, we're just kind of focusing on the past, but, but these phylogenies in many senses are, are, you know, sort of constantly changing. And I like this yeah. example of thinking about the virus as, you know, that virus as it's moving around the world and as it's, you know, sort of leaping from one species to another and then from one population to, no to another, you know, we can use phylogenetics to try to recreate or sort of trace that, that history. And that's something that's super powerful uh, as well and has a really nice, you know, application that we all hope uh, we can benefit from, uh, you know, shortly. Um, cool. Well, uh, Steph has offered to uh, share a little bit of his research and, and you'll see some of these themes that we've just talked about emerge in some of the stories that he's going to tell us uh, about some of his research. And some of it uh, is of particular interest to us at BYU Hawaii because, you know, he, he works in areas that are, you know, sort of fall within our, our, our community here, sort of in the Pacific. And so, so I'm excited to, to see and hear a little bit more of that. Uh, so we'll turn the, to the time over and the screen over to, to Seth now for a little bit to share us a bit, share uh, with us a bit more about that, that research. Go ahead, Seth. Yeah. So, uh, I think one of the cool questions we can, we can ask is, you know, you learned about phylogenetics in the classroom. Well, what can you do with, phy with phylogenetics? So a bit of a warning, this may be a little technical, maybe a little bit mind blowing because you haven't been confronted with a lot of these topics, but you can run them through with, with Dr. Ingley when, when we're done here and he has a good grasp on all these and he'll be able to help you understand what I'm talking about if I don't come across clearly and feel free to ask questions as I go along as well. Uh, Dr. Ingley, but yeah, so I study dragonflies, so I'll use a bunch of dragonfly examples. Um, I study a bunch of other organisms too, but dragonflies are kind of my bread and butter. So that's where we'll focus today. And, and we'll actually start off with a place that hopefully looks fairly uh, fairly familiar to to a lot of you. You've probably seen something like this in your class, right, where we have phylogenetics and the goal of phylogenetics is to diagnose where this common ancestor is along with this, along with this group of organisms. And what do we call this? We call this a monophyletic group. That is the goal of phylogenetic systematics at the base. The very basis of phylogenetic systematics is to find which groups are monophyletic and then which groups are not. And this is an example of a group that would not be monophyletic and those don't have a realistic evolutionary history. They don't share anything in common. They have no common ancestor. Um, if they look alike, it's because they evolved the, those features independently um, and they just don't give us a lot of evolutionary uh, information. And so the whole goal is to find these monophyletic groups with a common ancestor. And let me give you a simple example of this. 
Um, so there's not monophyletic. So this is uh, the island of Vanuatu. This is the country of Vanuatu and the island of Aramango on that island. Um, I, I run study abroads there. Um, I take, sometimes I've even taken BYU Hawaii students, but we'll go down for six weeks in these locations and we'll essentially focus on collecting insects. And what's cool about places like this is that students get hands-on experience. We get just these amazing stories that we get to tell. We get to interact with, interact with the locals here. Uh, here's a guy using my net to catch a dragonfly. I think he missed all 10 times, but we tried. Uh, and then, you know, we have students in the forest and we just get to see these amazing features as we travel around. Um, but what we're really after there is this one species called, uh, it's this genus of damselflies called Vanuatabasis. And they're pretty, they're not super large or flashy, um, but they're really important to a research question that we have in terms of how have dragonflies and damselflies colonized all of, uh, all of the South Pacific. And we're kind of staking our claim and starting in Vanuatu and Fiji. And this is where we were. Uh, this is what was known be in terms of areas that had been sampled for dragonflies before we came on our trips. And then through our trips, we've actually hit a lot of different places across the islands. And one of the things that we've been able to show is that before we came to Vanuatu, there were three known species of damselfly. And now that we've been through, we've added probably a dozen more. And, uh, and we're, looking at, we're, we're looking at dramatically increasing the known species in Vanuatu, which is really exciting to us. And we, have, we probably have one more trip there planned um, to really try and get a handle on the species diversity there. And so this is interesting, right? You've gone, we've, we've found these new species, we've described them, but as I mentioned, you have this tree of life that we're trying to reconstruct. So what we can actually do is we can take those species. So these are the three known species. We haven't put any of the new species into phylogeny yet. But when you look at this, you have Vanuatu basis sitting right here. And if you'll notice, Vanuatu basis itself is monophyletic, right? That all of those groups fit together. But if you look, it sits right in the middle of the damselflies from Fiji. So it makes those damselflies from Fiji, which are in another group called Nesobasis, it makes Nesobasis non-monophyletic, which means that if we want to understand the evolution of the Fijian fireflies, we have to also look at the, look at the Fijian dragonflies, excuse me, then we, we have to also look at the dragonflies from Vanuatu to understand it all. And that's kind of in a nutshell at the very basis how you can use phylogenetics. And you've probably seen examples like this. But I use dragonflies in a really large scale all around the world. <clears throat> we pull in all the dragonfly species we can to create a complete phylogeny of dragonflies. And why do we, you know, why do we focus on dragonflies? Well, there's really nice collections of dragonflies all around the world in the United States, in Europe, in South America. Um, they have, there's a, there's a really large extant and, uh, and fossil, like extant means living, really large living and fossil uh, record of the group. Um, the adult taxonomy, which is essentially how many species are described. Like we know, we know really well how many species of dragonfly there are in the world. We've actually, we estimate that we've actually almost collected them all and we know about almost all of them. Um, they represent a really primitive insect group. They're really old. Um, they're one of the first insect groups to evolve wings. Um, so they have some of the oldest flight, but not only that, they're, they are unmatched flyers in, uh, among all organisms. They fly better than bats and hummingbirds, et cetera. They're, they're probably the best flyers in the world. And they also have some really cool um, behaviors such as sexual conflict um, that I'm sure Dr. Ingley has talked to you about and will talk to you about since that's what some of his work has focused on too. Uh, I talked about how cool the fossils are. I'll just give you a, a quick example here. So this is from, uh, this is a fossil from Brazil. It's about 120 mil million years old. And if you take this fossil in your hands in the light and you move it back and forth, 
and you focus on this area right here, you actually see that there's metallic coloration. And you can, not only that, but you can see the muscle fibers here in the specimen. So these fossils are not only found often, but when you do find them, they are really well preserved and offer really cool insight into the evolutionary history that we don't get if we just look at living dragonflies today. So dragonflies are also really important in conservation. As I mentioned, I have a conservation background. I imagine some of you are thinking the same. Um, dragonflies have been really important in conservation. And these are little searches I've done since I started working on the group in about 2004. Um, and you know, in 2004, I did a Google search. There were 22,000 hits. In 2019, there's over 5 million. And this doesn't mean that there are you know, 5 million institutions working on dragonfly conservation. But what it does mean is that dragonflies are certainly growing as a conservation. Um, as a conservation tool. They're also, the general public gets them. When I say dragonfly, almost every one of you guys there in your class knows what a dragonfly is. Um, so we use them for outreach to educate the, the community. Um, they're really charismatic. Uh, they're found in art and jewelry, um, folklore. They're, they're in Japan and, uh, and a, a lot of Asian countries. They're really seen as a sacred organism. And then, of course, they've made their way into pop culture here. I mean, here's some tattoos of dragonflies that have come about. Um, although this one here isn't a dragonfly, if any of you are considering getting a tattoo, which you probably shouldn't because you're at BYU Hawaii, but if you did, these are antennae. Dragonflies don't have antennae. Um, if you get a tattoo with antennae, you're really getting what we call an owl fly, which is a cool organism in and of itself, but just know you're not getting a dragonfly. So let me tell you a little bit about dragonflies. Um, they're in the insect order called Odonata. And there are actually three major groups. So you have the dragonflies here in this group called Anisoptera. And then you have the damselflies here in this group called Zygoptera. And then you actually have this mixture of the two. It looks like these two had a baby, basically, that they hybridized. And you get another group called Anisozygoptera. I'm going to talk about these groups here. So Zygoptera has about 3,100 species. And to put that into context, there's only about uh, 6,000 species of, of mammals on Earth. So this one small group of, of, uh, of insects is actually half the size of mammals. And we have 27 families. They're just kind of like a, a really streamlined, skinny um, dragonfly. The wings are the same in shape and venation, and the eyes are far apart on the head. Whereas if you look at dragonflies, they have about 3,200 species um, and their, their bodies are really robust. Their wings are different in the shape and even the venation a little bit. And then the eyes are generally touching, which is what conjunct means. They're together. And then Anisozygoptera, the one that I was talking about that looked like a hybrid between these two, kind of has this robust body, but it has wings that are the same in shape and even the venation, the, the, the veins that run through the wing and their eyes are far apart. So what we wanna do is we wanna, we wanna create a phylogeny to figure out how all these groups are related to each other. And this is a phylogeny that some colleagues of mine have, several of my colleagues have contributed to. And if you look, you have dragonflies right here in this picture, and they are appear to be most closely related to the Anisozygoptera here, the, the hybrid looking thing. And then if you come down in here, you've got the damselflies, which is in the group Zygoptera. And you can see when you look at this, you have these areas where we have this branch that says, we know this branch sits here, but we don't know how it's related to either this family Gomphidae or these other families down here. And you can see those branches throughout. And you'll notice when we get to damselflies, we have huge problems where even when we look at a lot, look at three genes of DNA, like it doesn't really give us a clear picture or at least a well-supported picture of what dragonfly phylogeny looks like. So it's really important that we get what we call resolution, that we can sort these branches out. And so what my colleagues and I have done is we have taken about 16,000 genes, sorry, 1,600 genes for about uh, 83 what we call taxa. You can think of these as species, 83 different species and used about 1600 genes to create this phylogeny. And what you'll see right off the bat is that this phylogeny is very well resolved. We don't have those same what we call polytomies. We don't have these same breakdowns where we can't tell what's related to what. 
And now we can start to see what is related to what. And so here we have the anisozygoptera again, right? The one that looks like the hybrid that is, that is sitting next to all dragonflies. So it's most closely related to dragonflies according to our phylogeny. And then we have the damselflies here with a lot more resolution. And then there's two groups that we still haven't included. These are two South American groups that we need to get to include in our phylogeny. So there's always work to be done. But we're really happy that we got this result. And this allows us to figure out how many families there are and which gene, which genera fit in which families and which families fit within which suborders, and then kind of get an idea of the classification of dragonflies, right? Looking at monophyly and paraphyly. Um, but there's a lot more you can do with a phylogeny once you have one. And so this is an example, this is pretty intense, I realize. Don't worry too much about these graphs here. These graphs just tell us um, the range of something. I'll explain it. So what we've done is we've taken these same 83 taxa, the same 1600 genes, and we've, and we've, but this time we've included some fossils. And we've said, okay, there's a fossil that goes here, and there's a fossil that goes here, and there's one that's here, and one that's here. And those fossils are found in different time periods. And what we're able to do is use the fossils and what we know about each group and the replicate and the, the constant change in the DNA. And we're able to create a time, an estimate of time, how old a lineage is based on how much DNA mutation it has. And that's what you're seeing here. And so we can go back and we can say, okay, dragonflies, like living dragonflies got their start sometime in the Triassic between 250 million and 200 million years ago. And that's kind of a cool story to tell. And then the other thing we can do with this is we can, we can take this same phylogeny and we can compare all of the genes in our phylogeny and we can, and by comparing all the genes in our phylogeny, we can actually look and see, Hey, have these, have these dragonflies or damselflies hybridized at any point in time? And you look here and let me kind of walk you through this. So you look here and there's like just this crazy net going on here. Like you can't, it's hard to even make sense of it, right? And that is a signal of lots and lots of hybridization that's happened between these species of damselfly. But you can come down here, like this group of dragonflies, right? And that network is way is is way less intense. It's much more clear. So you can see there's kind of this background of constant hybridization, which you can see in certain parts of the tree, like here, and kind of as you come towards the tips of the tree here, you can see there's been much less hybridization than if you focus in a group like this. And it's cool for us because we can come in and we can be like, hey, look at this, look at this suborder. Remember I told you this thing looks like a hybrid? Well, if you trace where it gets its genetics from on this tree, it shares almost 50% of its genetics from damselflies and almost 50% of its genetics from dragonflies. And you can see that this group actually evolved through hybridization. We call that reticulate evolution. And it's, it's kind of a, a new thing that we're studying in phylogenetics right now and trying to wrap our heads around. Um, and we actually haven't even published this data. We're going to submit it probably within with this week or next week. So you guys are getting this uh, before the rest of the world. And uh, and this should this is probably an example that will end up in your textbook someday, where you'll be able to look at this and, you know, when some of you are teaching biology in ten years, you can look back and be like, oh, I remember that story. I got told that story before the rest of the world. So I'll certainly cool. I'll certainly use it uh, even if it's not in the textbook. <laughs> Good. If, if I write it, if I write a textbook, I'll I'll put it in there. Okay, I appreciate that. <laughs> and so you know, here's some other things I just point out. Right, this is the really messy hybridization that we're seeing here, and it turns out that these are actually some of the hardest relationships to resolve on our phylogeny. And it's why when I showed you that original um, phylogeny of damselflies, where everything was just all broken down and there was no in, in that big polytomy it's because of the hybridization that we're seeing here uh, evidence for. Um, when you have these phylogenies, you can, you, can, you can take your knowledge of what you know about fossils and you can, you can so this is essentially on this side, this is the fossil abundance for, yeah, of dragonflies from the Carboniferous all the way to essentially the present. And we can, 
we can take all these, uh, what we know about the number of fossils, and we can take what we know about our phylogeny here, and we can say, okay, this is how the phylogeny broke down, and we can actually combine those. And on this side right here, this is an estimate of how many living lineages there were using our phylogeny. And this is a little bit complex, I realize, but this is called a lineage through time plot. And what's really cool about this is we can look at things like extinctions. And we can go in and we can say, hey, dragonfly, like living dragonflies really started to take off in the Triassic. And we know from the fossil record that there was actually an extinction here. And then we start to see more fossils again. And then we see them start to explode in terms of extant lineages. And what's interesting is major amounts of from this estimate, we can, on this red dot, we can look here, and this is like where major amounts of living dragonflies started to speciate and diversify somewhere in the Cretaceous. And this is really cool because we can look at where they're starting to explode, right? And we can, we can see things like, this is also when angiosperms started to like flowering plants started to explode. And what do we know about flowering plants? Well, when flowering plants started to explode and diversify on the earth, we had herbivorous insects that started to feed on those plants. And we know that dragonflies feed on herbivorous insects. And so probably the fact that plants came around and drove the prey to diversify of dragonflies allowed for dragonflies to diversify, which is really fascinating to think about. Um, and then I'll totally change gears here. When you're looking at visual systems and color, which is another thing we can do once we have a phylogeny. So we know that insects see color different than us. So this is what, if we're looking at a, a butterfly on a flower, this is what we would see. But because insects can see more color than we can, this is essentially what, the, what they would see, but not quite, because insects don't see color as well as we see it right, that, that they don't have what we call like fine grain perception. And so when really what a butterfly is probably seeing is this. So here's the ultraviolet signal. Um, here's the rest of the color, but it's very pixelated. Whereas us as humans, we're seeing this side of things. And the reason that these insects are able to see more color than we are is, is, is found here. So us as humans, we have what we call an opsin, which is essentially this, this arrangement of this gene around what we call a chromophore. A chromophore captures light and an, electro, an electric reaction happens and it transfers um, that into the opsin. And then and all of this together is called photopigment. So the, the different amino acid composition of these opsins determines what light um, an organism can see. And that's why us as humans were limited because as humans, we only have options that allow us to see blue and kind of this green red if you're not colorblind. If you're colorblind, then there's only one peak out here. And you can talk to Dr. Bybee there, BYU Hawaii, about that. Um, he's actually colorblind, so we like to give him a hard time about it. And then when you look, here at insects, insects can see in the ultraviolet, in the blue, and then like us also in the long wavelength. And there's some groups of organisms like birds that appear to be able to see extensively in color. So they're not, well, they're seeing ultraviolet, although not as deeply as insects, they're seeing ultraviolet, they're seeing blues really well, and then all the way out here into the long wavelength, which are your yellows, oranges, and reds, and some greens. And so, kind of with this as background knowledge, I wanted to understand how many opsins do dragonflies have and what colors can dragonflies see? And we still don't have a great handle on what colors dragonflies can see, although we do know for sure that they can see ultraviolet all the way to the long wavelength. We're not sure how well they can see all the colors in between, but it looks like they can see them better perhaps than any other terrestrial animal known to this point. And so this is what we're looking at here. So when you look at dragonflies, they have one ultraviolet opsin here, and then they have two short, wave, short wavelength opsins. So these are opsins that see blue, 
essentially. And they have at least two. And then they have long wavelength options. When you're looking at this, right, they've got two, four, six, eight, ten. They've got at least ten of those. And then these, these like more um, translucent ones are just like the range. So one species might have two blues, another species might have up to eight blue copies. And what this means is that these dragonflies can almost certainly see shades of blue way better than we could ever appreciate them. And then the long wavelength vision is much more sharp uh, and they're able to discriminate between colors better than humans ever could dream of, of doing and even any other animal known. Um, does that make sense? Be, uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's pretty amazing. And I think, um, so, so you, so you mentioned that this would put them in a range, you know, even higher than, than birds, right? You said yeah. like, in, than any other terrestrial mammals. So even, even birds that have that amazing, you know, uh, you know, variation in their, in their visual system probably can't see nearly as much color as the dragonflies have. Yeah. And they might be able to see color a little more sharply just because their eyes sure. don't see as pixelated um generally but but yeah i mean these guys can discriminate colors uh, much much better than than birds or any mammal any animal it appears yeah and this and this is you know this is like and this isn't just <laughs> you know they could see like a couple more colors right i mean they can see like many 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 more subtle variations right combination yeah. cover color yeah. it increases so almost exponentially right exactly yeah so us as humans you know we might look at a green and be like oh okay cool that's green but a dragonfly is going to see like every strip of this right they're going to understand oh there's a green there's another shade of green there's another shade of green there's another shade of green there's you know like they're going to see it really clearly which is awesome. you know what we're trying to understand at least that's the hypothesis now that um that they see color much much better than we do and, and one of the things we can do is we can, we can take this knowledge now. We can say, okay, we know how many copies of opsins different dragonflies have, and we can put it back on a phylogeny. And we can say, okay, this species right here, Archelestes grandis, has 12 long wavelengths, one blue and, and one UV. And then we can kind of do that for each one of these species. And then we can start to recreate what the ancestor's visual system was. And so you can see that this ancestor had one more long wavelength than, than it appears like its progenitors had, right? Like they gained a long wavelength here. And as you kind of work back in the phylogeny, you can go all the way back to the very first, what we estimate to be the very first dragonfly. And we can see that it had one ultraviolet opsin, two blue opsins, and 10 long wavelength opsins, despite all this diversity. So if that makes sense for people. Yeah, no, I think it, I think it will. And we've, because we, we're, we're talking, you know, quite a bit about, you know, both in our discussions on phylogenetics specifically, and just sort of how to build phylogenies and what they mean. We've talked about sort of mapping different characters, different traits on those phylogenies. And then, you know, in our entire discussion of, you know, diversity of plants and animals, we're doing that in a phylogenetic context as well. So I think, um, you know, I think this, this is, this is going to be really interesting, uh, to them for that, for that, from that perspective. And one thing that I find really fascinating about this is that, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, we're using genes to build this phylogeny and then we're using that phylogeny to understand the evolution of essentially genes, right? I mean, it's kind yeah. of this, it's this really interesting kind of feedback loop where, uh, you know, in, in, in many of our examples that we look at in class, we're looking at the evolution of like morphological traits, right? I mean, we're looking at kind of these key foundational characteristics that have evolved over time. And we think of them as kind of these, you know, concrete uh, traits, um, but we can use phylogenies. I think this is so cool because we can also use phylogenies to understand molecular evolution and then that then feeds back into understanding, you know, the, these phenotypes that we think about and that we're so fascinated by. Uh, so I think for that reason, uh, you know, and for lots of other reasons, this is a really cool, cool.
cool example to think about. Yeah, and 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 hopefully I don't go too deep here, but I'm going to show you some other ways we can look at at the evolution of 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 these genes as well. Because now we have this phylogeny, we can map the evolution of opsin genes across it, and we can get an estimate of what the ancestor of all dragonflies had for opsins. We can also create a phylogeny of just opsins. And this allows us to see how the ultraviolet opsins have evolved next to the blue opsins. But not only that, we can look how the different species of, you know, how the, how the blue opsins have evolved within cross dragonflies particularly. And then you've got this massive group of long wavelength opsins that we're also able to study. Um, and we can, so this allows us in short to, to look at just the evolution of the opsins without including um, a larger tree of dragonfly species. And that's, that's really cool and powerful to think about um, looking at yeah. just the evolution of a single gene. That, yeah, that is cool. And, and once we have this evolution of a single gene, we can actually run analyses. So you guys know in evolutionary biology, right, that you have selection on a gene or, and selection on an organism. And we can, we can actually measure the amount of selection on a single gene. And that's what you see in this, in this graph right here. So these are opsins. This is the amount of selection that happens on all insect opsins right there. So you can see it's next, you know, it's, it's approaching zero, not much at all. And then this is the amount of selection that happens on the ultraviolet um, opsins. And this is the amount of selection that happens on the blue opsins. And you can see that there's almost the exact same amount of selection happening on the ultraviolet and the blue opsins. But when you look, when you come over here and you look at the long wavelength opsins, so they're in this graph, the average amount of selection on those opsins is right here. And so what you can see is that selection is actually, um, is actually much less on the long wavelength opsins than it is uh, here on the short, on the UV and the blue opsins. So it's essentially been relaxed. So on this one here, when you're looking, um, this, is, this is essentially, um, uh, high amounts of selection all the way to um, to like relaxed amounts of selection. So, so this this is cool because to think about because you know we've kind of talked about natural selection acting on you know phenotypes and the underlying genes, um, but approaching that in the study of that from like a this hands on you know field perspective, you know, I mean, we've talked about finches and, you know, other, other groups where, you know, we're kind of quantifying that selection that's acting on, you know, actual organisms. And the cool thing about this is that we can go in and, you know, sequence all these genes and get a picture of how selection is acting on these very specific traits without doing anything in the field, right? <laughs> I mean, this is yeah. like this really cool extra layer of, you know, this is like ultra detective work in terms of figuring out, you know, what's going on out in the real world. How is that impacting, uh, you know, these very specific traits and the genes that are underlying those traits. Uh, and that, that just gives us really, really neat, uh, you know, additional layer of complexity and a really, really cool approach to understanding natural selection. Yeah. Yeah. And you, I mean, and you can see, like, as you look at this figure, like if you follow these bars here, right, this is the average amount of selection on these opsins. And it's, it kind of tells a really cool story. And that, and that might be this, one of the things we're thinking is that this is almost certainly why there are so many long wavelength opsins yeah. is that the selection pressure on those opsins is relaxed. So there can be a lot of them, yeah, but the more cool. pressure you have, the harder it is for those genes to stick around. Um, and so this kind of leads to the, to a really na natural question, you know, is, is, uh, how is dragonfly or odonate, right? Odonata is the, the group. How has dragonfly color evolved and does it, can it drive species diversity? Um, and so what we've done is we've gone in and we've measured color across all sorts of dragonflies. And I know a lot of people think, oh, dragonflies are cool and they're colorful, but dragonflies, and rival butterflies in their color, right? They're one of the most colorful groups on earth and they're so old that they may have actually been one of the first multicolored 
uh, insects, which is interesting to think about. So color probably had a really important evolutionary role in this group. And so what we've done is we've gone in and we've measured color across dragonflies and we can put this in kind of this box plot and you're able to see which colors are really important and diverse in dragonflies. And not only that, but we can make a box plot for each group of dragonflies we're interested in. So here, these are box plots for different dragonfly families. And you can see like this family right here, Synagrionidae, this has about 1200 species in just this one family. And Gomphidae, this is, a, this is another family that has almost 1200 species. And you can see that this group has way fewer, has much less color than a group like this. Right, and so, so that kind of makes us think, oh, well maybe color isn't a driver of species diversity. But then you look at another group like Libellulidae, this group right here also has about 1200 species and you can see that it has a massive array of color, something similar to Synagrionidae. Then there's other groups that aren't as speciose and you can see that they don't, they actually don't cover tons of color space, but they do cover more color space here. Um, generally, the trend that we saw was the more color, the more species. And we actually turned this into a graph. And what you're seeing here is this is uh, the number of species on the bottom, and this is the essentially the num the the amount of color in each family. And what you'll see is as the family gets more speciose, there's more color found in each group. And that's really interesting from a graph, you know, in a graph perspective, but this doesn't mean that color drives species. It just means that families that are more diverse have more color and that almost makes sense, right? If you have more species, there's just more opportunity to find color. So we actually need to investigate this in a phylogenetic context to see if, if this coloration uh, means something phylogenetically. And so this is what we've done. We've taken all this color data and we've pushed it onto a big phylogeny. But not only that, we wanted to ask some other questions about um, lodic habitats, which are fast running water, and lentic habitats, which are essentially still water, like ponds and lakes. And we wanted to, to see, is there a relationship between coloration, lentic and lodic habitats, and a phylogeny? And this is in collaboration with two of my collaborators here in France. This is Fabien Condamine and this is Julien Renault. And this is what we found. So these are our preliminary evidence here. We found when we, when we look across a phylogeny, we can take our phylogeny and we can find essentially hot spots for speciation. So all these red dots mean that there's some sort of speciation happening here. And that speciation can either be slowing or speeding up. So where, it's, where it starts to look kind of red hot, there's been this evidence of rapid speedy speciation across the phylogeny. And you'll see that there's you know, eight or nine different places where there's been a lot of rapid speciation on the phylogeny, and then a few places where speciation is actually slowed down here on the blue. But what we did is we went in and we wanted to say, hey, does, is color associated with any of these rapid speciation trends? Um, and then how does, how does like living in a lentic habitat or a lotic habitat affect coloration. And what we found is, is that, that a lot of these rapid speciation trends that we find are associated with color. And we also found that, that a lot of these colorful groups are found in lotic fast moving habitats. So on like rivers and streams where the water moves. But there are other areas, right, where they're found in lentic habitats too. So that the answer isn't quite clear. It looks like it's almost 50-50. So it may be that lentic and lotic habitats really don't drive too much of speciation and that color is, but it's all, it's all a mix right now, right? We're still trying to sort this out. You guys are seeing science in action. And, and is this color that we're talking about, is this uh, mostly found in the males or is this yes. male and female? Maybe I'm getting Jump in the no, no, this is mostly just male coloration for now. And it just like a lot of animals, the males are generally the most colorful in dragonflies. So yeah. they're the ones that we pay the most attention to for I'm now. Cur I'm curious if, and maybe you'll get to this, or maybe you've done this, but um, uh, I'm curious if there is any uh, evidence that the groups that have like more drastic sexual dimorphism in color have faster evolutionary rates, faster speciation rates? 
that's one of the things that we want to look at. One of the big problems in a group in most insect groups is we is a lot of times we understand pretty well what's going on with males. Right. But we don't understand we it's even hard to identify females to species to make that connection but we just got a really large grant um, from the national science foundation and one of our goals is to try and look at questions like that to cool. we're going to use dna to actually associate females with ma males and then we can ask questions like that cool yeah should be pretty cool yeah it reminds me of uh, a little bit of some work on you know, like humming ver hummingbirds versus like swifts and swallows where you see kind of, you know, greater sexual dimorphism and greater speciation rates where you've got, you know, uh, you know, less, well, it comes back to sexual conflict and everything as well, but that's kind of what, what I mean. Yeah. This. No, it's definitely something we want to do. And some of my collaborators are really keen on doing that particular piece. It's just something really hard to do because we can yeah. really only identify species for maybe like females for maybe 50% of the species, which is yeah. crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's a big problem. Yeah. So how are the males doing it? <laughs> yeah, well, we'll try and sort that out first and then we'll ask. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so I mean, this is essentially, and I realize this has been fairly technical and there's lots of things that, that I hope didn't go too far over people's heads break it down like and show and i've only shown like the real just like the tip of the iceberg of how phylogenetics can be used i mean it is so powerful in human health and all sorts of other fields um but, but these are some cool things you can do in evolution and ecology basically you know and, and you know with that i'd just like to say thanks for for letting me um you know let me do this today and and if, you know, if you have any questions now or your students have any questions in the future, I'd be happy to field them. Awesome. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. That was awesome. I think another thing to point out uh, is that um, it's, it's hard to appreciate the amount of work that goes into, you know, that figure, like that last figure that you showed us, both, you know, the time and the effort in terms of, <laughs> you know, collecting the specimens and then doing the lab work and then doing the analyses and then building figures. I mean, these are, uh, you mentioned a, a very large grant <laughs> and the very large amounts of money that go into that. I mean, that's a lot of, it's years of work right there. And it's hard to, you know, it's easy as, you know, if you haven't done this to kind of look at it and think, oh, that's cool. Uh, and and sort of miss the, the um, you know, both the, the, the amount of the number of insights that we gain from it, but also just the amount of, you know, the amount of work, the massive amount of work yeah. that goes into that. Yeah, I mean, if you want me to put a number on this figure right here, this figure is the result of basically, I think about five years of research. Um, it included, we paid, um, it included three postdocs, um, it included, three graduate students and about 50 undergraduates to generate all the color <laughs> data. And this figure alone right here, if you want to put a, a number value on it, cost just over a million dollars, about $1.1 million. Yeah. So science is expensive, <laughs> but it's, it's really, it's really important to understand these things because anything I learn here could potentially be turned into um, technology, conservation, um, management practices. Uh, it can also teach us about how color evolves in our world, right? And, and, yeah. and there's just massive amounts of implications there too. So I know it sounds like it costs a lot, um, but it's, well, it's really important that we do this research so we can better understand the world around us. Well, and I think for phylogenetics, you know, in particular, it, you know, more so than many other fields, uh, more so than any other sort of, you know, research pursuits has really broad reaching implications. Um, it really is in a lot of ways kind of the backbone for our understanding. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's one of the most, you know, critical, uh, 
you know, fields that, that we have and tools that we have sort of within evolution and evolution is, you know, sort of the, you know, the foundation of all biology without understanding evolution, evolutionary history, uh, nothing else really makes sense. And so I think that's really important to keep that, keep that in perspective there as well. Awesome. Well, um, that was uh, really great and I learned a lot and that was fun also for me because uh, I, you know, I'm much more familiar with a lot of your earlier work and so it's fun to see what's been happening, uh, you know, and, and, you know, most recently and to see kind of everything that, um, that, that's been, uh, you know, uh, that, that you've been working on in recent years. You've done some really awesome stuff and we really appreciate uh, you sharing it. Uh, and I hope the students really enjoy seeing this and sort of, you know, you know we've talked a lot about phylogenetics and, and I oftentimes feel like they, you know, they get really sick of building phylogenies and doing things like that. But uh, I, you know, I try to reiterate over and over and I'm doing that again here that, you know, this is really foundational for our understanding of evolution. Uh, and there's really just so much power in a phylogeny. And I think, you know, we've gotten to see a little bit of that today with Dr. Bybee's research. And these are just a few little snippets, right, of, you know, it's, it's oh, yeah. the ice, tip of the iceberg. And so I definitely uh, appreciate that. Uh, is there any, any sort of parting words that you have that you want to share with anybody? Parting yeah, words? Yeah, I mean, I'll just, I'll just talk. Yeah, I'll, I'll toss this out there. Um, you know, I hope this wasn't too long. I hope students are still sticking around and watching this. Um, it's really interesting to me, like these parallels, right, that that like in our church, one of the most foundational things that we're taught is to understand our genealogy, where we came from, what yeah. we're a part of. And I don't, I don't, it's not, I think it's actually very cool that when you look at biology in general, the idea also is one of the most foundational pieces is phylogeny, which is essentially genealogy and where, where organisms came from, how they all fit together. And even to some degree where we fit in all yeah. of that, it's really cool. And Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And so just kind of, you know, as students struggle with this, why is it important? What are we doing? Like there are parallels to be drawn here. Yeah. Awesome. That's a great, uh, great note to end on Seth. And thank you so much again for, for joining us all the way from uh, France. Uh, it's the start of your day and I hope the rest of your day is, goes great. So uh, go ahead and close down the recording and say, thanks Seth. Thanks for having me.